Hello. Welcome to the second panel of our symposium today, Equity and Ethics. Thank you guys for all coming back and reconvening on time. I'm gonna, I will be moderating the panel today. My name is Julie Harris Way, and I am a faculty member at the University of California, San Francisco in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences as well as our emerging program on bioethics. So I am delighted to be the moderator for this session with many of the, of, of, of all of these wonderful topics today. So as you heard in our introductory session, a central theme of this symposium over the past three years has been inequities and in how we have built our healthcare systems in the past. So learning health systems presents a novel opportunity to rectify some of these mistakes, but also undoubtedly uh, new ways to compound or enable them. So this panel will focus on ethical issues in the way we design our trials, but also how people end up in our systems and how we can diversify learning healthcare systems. And um, I, I want to sort of uh, remind us of Ramesh's comment from the last session about social determinants of health in the learning health system and how it really, what you measure and what is in there will also define what your outcomes are and what your potential interventions are. So because if there are inequities in the data that feed learning health, um, there will also be undoubtedly inequities in how well those data can help different communities. So I'm going to introduce each of our speakers and our discussant today, and then they will um, get started. So Jeremy Sugarman is our first speaker today. Um, Dr. Sugarman is the Harvey M. Meyerhoff Professor of Bioethics and Medicine, Professor of Medicine, Professor of Health Policy and Management, and the Deputy Director for Medicine of the Berman Institute of Bioethics at Johns Hopkins. Um, he is an internationally recognized leader in the field of biomedical ethics, with particular expertise in applying empirical methods and evidence-based standards for evaluating and analyzing bioethical issues. Dr. Sugarman served as Senior Policy and Research Analyst for the White House Advisory Commission and Senior Advisor to the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues. His contributions to both medical ethics and policy include his work on the ethics of informed consent, umbilical cord blood banking, stem cell research, international HIV prevention research, global health, and research oversight. So he's been not that busy lately. So welcome, Dr. Sugarman. Our second speaker, Professor Anya Price, is an associate professor at University of Iowa College of Law. She was recently awarded a Pathway to Independence Award from the National Human Genome Research Institute to examine the use of genetic information by life, long-term care, and disability insurers. So congratulations on that award. Her teaching and research interests explore the ethical, legal, and social implications of genomic testing with a particular focus on genetic discrimination and privacy rights the intersection of clinical and research ethics and insurance coverage of genetic technologies and interventions. So I really look forward to hearing your talk as well, Professor Price. Uh, Prince, sorry. Uh, and our final speaker for the panel is Prof Professor Shaniqua Collier, who is an associate professor in the Department of Clinical Research and Leadership, as well as Director of Doctoral Research of the Translational Health Sciences Doctoral Program of the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. She is also a professorial lecturer in law at the George Washington University Law School and special volunteer at the Center for Research on Genomics and Global Health of the National Human Genome Research Institute at the NIH. Her research focuses on topics related to precision medicine research and health disparities, diversity and inclusion in genomic research, genomic incidental findings, the use of race in medicine, pharmacogenomics, and the use of personalized genomic testing as an educational tool. So welcome, Professor Collier. And finally, last but not least, our uh, esteemed discussant for this panel is Dr. Erica Marsh. Uh, Dr. Marsh is the Associate Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Chief of the Division of Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility and founder and executive director of the Women's Health and Reproductive Disparities Program, as well as faculty lead of community engagement for the Michigan Institute for Clinical and Health Research all of, at, at the University of Michigan Medical School. Her research area of interest is comparative reproductive health across populations, with a particular interest in abnormal uterine bleeding, 
uterine fibroids, and ovarian reserve. She has re received numerous awards for her research, including being named the 2015 Ira and Esther Rosenwalk's New Investigator of the Year by the American Society of Reproductive Medicine. Congratulations. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Marsh. Each speaker is gonna have 15 minutes to present, just like in the last panel. And we ask that you hold your questions until the very end, and we'll have about 30 minutes for discussion. So Dr. Sugarman, the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much, and uh, thanks for the nice introductions. Thanks for the invitation. It's good to be back in um, Ann Arbor. Uh, the last time I was here, I gave the Kuhn Lecture, which was clearly in the research silo on research ethics, um, but it's good to see some um, old friends and colleagues. So um, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, some lingering and emerging ethical issues for pragmatic clinical trials in learning health systems. And we assume, and it's a sort of tacit assumption and sometimes not so tacit assumption, that we're in this because we have some kind of obligation to improve the quality of care that pe we are delivering or people are getting. And without that assumption, none of this all works. Before I start, let me uh, go through my uh, to do. Did you like that next slide? He's not going. It says do not touch. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Yeah, it's not working either. Let's see. Oh, yeah. All right, I did that one. I did that one. Oh, uh, well, let's try oh, this. Well, let's just try this way. Oh, okay. It's good they built in redundancies, huh? Okay, so uh, I'm supposed to uh, do these disclosures. I, I do want to tell you I am a member of Merck uh, KGA's Bioethics Advisory Panel and their Stem Cell Research Oversight Committee and a member of IQVIA uh, Ethics Advisory Panel. Those are not related to what I'm discussing, but um, it's out there. Um, I do co-chair the Ethics and Regulatory Core for the NIH Healthcare Systems Research Collaboratory and co-led the Ethics and Regulatory Task Force for PCORNET. Uh, those are directly related to what I'm going to talk about. I uh, receive salary and grant support through Johns Hopkins for this work, but not enough. Um, and the views here are completely um, my own. So, uh, so this is the brief overview of what I'd like to do. I want to talk about some areas that we need some attention or we've addressed. There are some conceptual issues, our favorite study support, um, some basic ethical issues in pragmatic clinical trials, some signals from empirical research, and um, emerging issues. Um, given how brief this talk is, my hope is really to simply sketch some of the major ethical issues to sort of instigate a little bit of conversation and concern and probably not solve any of them. Um, I'm going to give you some prominent examples to illustrate my points and trigger this discussion. Um, this is not meant to be a comprehensive argument about any one of these issues, which would demand sort of an hour uh, at least to, to go into in detail. So this slide, uh, or similar version of this, is already put up the first thing in the morning. You know, we didn't coordinate our slides, and we didn't coordinate the colors of our jackets or ties if we still, I don't know why I do this, uh, but I've got one on today, and I think I tied it right. Um, so this... Uh, work that was put forward by my colleagues, um, Ruth Faden, Nancy Cass, Steve Goodman, Peter Pronovos, Sean Tunis, and Tom Beecham, has been talked about a lot. This is like this document that drives people who love learning health systems. When this thing came out, it was like, oh, this is what we're doing. We have a framework. We can go back. We can battle the IRB. We can tell them exactly how they're wrong. This is the coolest thing. There's an ethical justification for what we do. Well, it's fairly good descriptively, and as much as I love these people and work with them all the time, there are some lingering questions of the framework. The framework does not solve all the problems related to the ethics of learning health system, and you'll see that as we encounter practical problems when we try to field different efforts at learning. Most importantly, the framework that they articulated only works in a truly realized learning health system. It is aspirational. There are no true learning health systems in the robust fashion that are envisioned to justify the departures from the normal things we do to protect the rights, interests, and well-being of people in those systems. So until we realize an ethical, a, a, a comprehensive learning health system, this framework does not work. It's not meant to work in our transition state. And most importantly, for the kind of re re work that we do, the last item of their framework, the one where patients have an obligation, not those of us in the healthcare setting, 
or in the research world have an obligation to gather data, but the obligation for patients to waive their rights and their interests in the name of learning doesn't follow unless the system really continuously learns and is just. But until that time, we can't take away other things that are promised. Starting easy, huh? Let's move on. So if that wasn't controversial, so many of you may know, um, and, and this isn't blurry uh, simply because I wanted to protect anybody, but this is a determination from the Office of Human Research Protection. Um, very few people in the Department of Health and Human Services get to wear a badge. These folks get to wear a badge. And they get to close down research programs that they don't think are okay. And you may remember that there was a study called SUPPORT. And SUPPORT was a study that involved two arms for the treatment of low birth weight infants about whether they should receive high oxygenation or they should receive lower oxygenation. If you receive high oxygenation, there were problems with oxygen toxicity. Most, uh, of most concern to the investigators at the time was that it would be retinal damage. In the low oxygen arm, there was a concern uh, that they might be otherwise harmed in some way, but it was unclear. There was clinical equipoise, and Michelle, I love your slide on your equipoise. Uh, doctors didn't know. Most patients don't go into a, or parents of a newborn who've just had a premature birth, don't come in and have a predetermined preference for a lower or higher oxygen arm. It's not for the first thing people wanna think about. They're in a terrible situation. They're in dire straits. The, the infant is, is in peril. You have to treat, and both of these arms were arguably within the standard of care, and people didn't know what to do. If you were to tweak investigators and ask them what they were more worried about, they didn't want to have to be blinding unnecessarily these, these premature infants, but they were worried about oxygen toxicity and the effects it could have. They were more worried about the high oxygen arm than they were at the low oxygen arm. Um, in a study reported in a regional medical journal, I believe, uh, so that's published somewhere outside of Boston, um, New England Journal or something, regional, I don't know, I don't, anyway. The, sort of they go through their description of the study and, and what happens is, guess what? The babies in the low oxygen arm, they die. More die. Not a lot more, but they die. So there's a mortality risk to the lower arm. Now this is a hugely complicated study. Don't get me wrong, but people were worried about the ethics of this study. Lots of people were worried. So much so in that journal, there were two alternative uh, views of the ethics of this research, both uh, by bioethicists who do work in this area. So two tribes of bioethicists, who knew we had two tribes, right? I actually happen to be in the, uh, the tribe on the top, that's why I put it on the top. Um, and then the others on the bottom have a different view about the ethics of this research and whether it was appropriate. These are substantially different views about what is right and what ought to be in the research setting. And there, this has fueled not only conceptual discussion, don't worry, it's like watching a fist fight in a sociology department, don't, it's not the best place to go. Watching bioethicists fight, you know, it's, it's okay. Um, we fight with words, it's better. But it led to a public hearing, it was pretty well behaved, lots of people in the room participated, there was an Institute of Medicine, National Academy of Medicine workshop, lots of spirited discussion no solutions, but major areas of controversy over a single study, despite multiple people deliberating about it, about whether consent was appropriate, whether it was correct, what were the risks and the benefits, and what can you anticipate looking forward, and what can you do retrospectively, and what was the standard of care? And if you tweak the standard of care somewhat, slightly, so you can study it, have you manipulated the standard of care? None of these are settled issues. Lots of people have passionate views, but none are settled. Now, in this wake, um, there have been several major national efforts to do things that are important to learning health systems, so things like pragmatic clinical trials, patient-centered research. Background condition, broad moral claim to obtain evidence to improve clinical practice. Most of the decisions we make as patients or we make as clinicians or we make as health systems are not informed by data. Um, they are informed by different intuitions, by the revenue streams, by all some of the tensions that were already discussed this morning. And the cool thing, as everyone in this room probably knows, or you're in the wrong room, is that technology permits the ability to conduct large-scale trials with minimal interventions. And it's getting better all the time with mobile devices and other things that we could do so that the incremental burden on participants is small, okay? 
That led to these two big efforts. The first is the NIH Healthcare Systems Research Collaboratory, really catchy term. Um, the requirements of this is a pragmatic clinical trial design. There has to be an electronic health record as the core data collection instrument, no research nurses, no research coordinators, no extra stuff, all the things that we're accustomed to in the research world, not there. At least two integrated health systems collaborating. If you think it's hard for bioethicists to talk together, talk about health systems, your friends around the corner, let's share our IT, let's share the code, nice. People agreed to do this for NIH money, which isn't huge. It's amazing, people, what we jump for. Like, ugh, anyway, different <laughs> different issue. Uh, ten de it's all, it comes with all the cred, right? Street cred, I got my K, got my R, got my A. Hey, oh, oh, no, it's right, everything, it's good. Uh, <laughs> 10 demonstration projects, um, and there are, there are five new projects moving forward. The Healthcare Systems Research Collaboratory, we have studies across um, the entire United States, and these are great. Some of these are just great studies. I mean, they're all my favorite. But of my favorites, I'll give you an example, Laura Denver's time trial. The simple question in the time trial was, is slightly longer dialysis times better than normal dialysis times? Most dialysis sessions are four hours. Some data suggests that if you go four plus hours, not much, four hours, 15 minutes, four hours and 30 minutes, you get better outcomes. Most patients don't love being on dialysis, but if there's a, a mortality benefit for staying on it, we can suck that up. If you are a dialysis center, four hours plus four hours equals eight hours, four and a half hours and four and a half hours is nine hours, and that's overtime. It's hugely expensive, so it better be worth the squash. So she did a cluster randomized trial in the two biggest dialysis centers around. Similarly, uh, Susan Huang at UC Irvine did a study called ABATE. We know that in the intensive care unit, that if we use mucoprosin and we wash people off with chlorhexidine, we decrease the nosocomial infection rate substantially, and it's life-saving. Infections are the main thing that, you know, or one of the main things that kill people in hospitals. Uh, not slipping on the snow on the way in, but you know that's another problem to address on a for not in the summer, and. Um, she did, said, well, what about hospitalized patients where infections are also important? And so she did the same thing, cluster randomized trials. Okay, just a sense, that's what we did. To start these trials off, um, and I have to say, when Rob Califf, who was the PI of the NIH uh, collaboratory, asked me to do the ethics piece, he said, this is gonna be slam dunk. It's none of that IRB stuff that you're normally used to. What we're gonna be doing is doing minimal risk research. I don't think you're gonna even earn your 10% effort on this. So, <laughs> so anyway, what we did at the outset of the collaboratory is rather than just wait for the um, proverbial um, problems to hit the fan, what we did is we held multi-stakeholder conversations at the planning stage that we convened and we got everybody on the, on the um, calls together. And that included investigators in the research teams, sponsors, IRBs, and regulators. So remember, this we are doing the same kind of research that was causing a bit of uh, excitement like support. Now we're telling people that in these settings that are potentially minimal risk, we want to waive consent. It's all standard of care. We don't need all the protections in place. We were scared, right? And so the question is, is it appropriate to take away these protections at a time where the policy debates are waging? What would you do? Do you take the most conservative approach? Do you put on a seatbelt plus a helmet? Or do you take off both seatbelt and helmet because you're only going three miles an hour? What's the right thing to do and how can you do it and the church is not doable? Can you get consent from every uh, person who's hospitalized uh, and well, what kind of soap we're gonna use in a hospital? Or whether we're gonna put some ointment up their nose? And it, who are the subjects in that case, by the way? Is it the patients or the nurses or, and, and who's facing risk of a nosocomial infection, the other patients or the visitors? If you start really digging into any of this, it's like an ethics ex final exam problem, right? It's really hard to solve. Anyway, we decided to make this public and make everything transparent. We, we reviewed uh, minutes from those calls and posted them and we got updates. And we fielded uh, almost all of the first round or finishing up without real complications. We've had a couple, and some are getting a little tasty, as I'll tell you about later. So we captured this. We were so surprised at the ethical issues, though, we encountered in these calls 
that we wrote a paper, Rob and I, in JAMA, just outlining these issues. We picked our favorite 10. Why? Born 10 fingers, 10 toes. You know, 10 things are good. We captured those 10 problems in JAMA. We also had huge, oh my goodness, we had huge problems with cluster random. I didn't get, didn't, did you show me the five minute one? Oh man. Okay, so cluster randomized trials. Um, we, had, we convened a working group because these were posing special issue. We then grabbed a bunch of people together to join this thing we called the Jamboree and we called in experts to work on each of the 10 problems plus privacy, which we hadn't hit uh, in the collaboratory as much as it had in PCORnet and as it did in, in the UK with the example we talked about earlier. In that special supplement, we have tons of stories about how do we solve these are lingering issues in uh, pragmatic clinical trials. Consent, uh, data monitoring, defining minimal risk, QI, vulnerable subjects, who gets enrolled versus do you use the regular research protections, how do IRBs harmonize, who are the gatekeepers, uh, we talk about gatekeepers in international research, like the village chief. Uh, we have village chiefs here, like CEOs. Uh, we have clinical practice chairs. There's your huge village chiefs. You don't get in unless you do it. Um, who's indirect subjects, FDA projects, nature of the intervention, and privacy. All right. There's a ton of empirical data. Michelle mentioned some of it today that's coming out. We've been gathering empirical data to inform some of these ethical deliberations. What are the quick signals that are coming out about this? And we can talk about this later in question and answers. But one general lesson that we're learning is that at least a substantial minority of people want to be meaningfully engaged in research decision making, and that's regardless of risk, regardless of healthcare norms, regardless of how you ask them. People care about being asked. It's unclear if the nature of the activities are clearly, uh, clearly understood and their best interests were not compromised, what they would do. And we, this is really critical to crack because if we tr do require traditional written informed consent, the projects may become undoable. <laughs> Finally, the last thing we're seeing is emerging issues. What are the appropriate standards for data monitoring in these trials? We have one trial in the field right now uh, which had some problem, they were obtaining consent, but what's the right GCP for PCTs. So good clinical practices for pragmatic clinical trials, effectiveness research versus efficacy research. The model doesn't fit because you don't have primary source documents. But what are the right standards for making sure the data quality are there? What about in PCORI, they're facing huge issues on having patients in non-traditional roles. So having patients as members of healthcare teams, what training do they receive in privacy? Do their lobbying for a particular disease affect how they might obtain consent or how someone might, might do that? And a final project that we just got funded from the collaboratory is how do we manage incidental findings uh, in the setting of pragmatic clinical trials? We're doing an empirical and conceptual project on that, which raises huge issues, especially if people haven't given consent. So all the lessons from the genetics literature don't work. Tell people you're going to find things and you're not going to tell them. Well, you haven't told them anything. So what do you do when you get that incidental finding and you've got to do it? So ho I hope I've shown you that there's still a bunch of problems. There's uh, substantial empirical attention, and we have to uh, ground this work in actual experiences. Sorry to going over. All righty. Um, well, thank you so much. I'll uh, keep mine a little short. How's that? We'll <laughs> balance out. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, some of the research that I'm doing that's actually outside of learning health systems, but reflecting back in. So uh, academics always love the, the colon after a title, right? So this could be pre prevention, coercion, or both. What can learning health systems learn from data collection by outside actors, right? Um, Oh, I'm going to have the same problem. I'm learning from you. Uh-huh. All right. Um, so one of my areas of research is looking at using genetics as prevention, right? So we have to have a learning health system that collects genomic data. And one of the reasons that that's good is because we can put that into medical records, especially pharmacogenetics, um, or we're talking about incidental findings. We can use um, information that comes from this data and help to actually prevent disease rather than just using it to treat, right? Um, 
And so I want to talk a little bit about genetic screening in society at large, and then what this means for challenges for our learning health system and opportunities. And I think about this a lot. Um, I, I came from a project that was looking at doing genetic screening in healthy adults as a way to merge that in to um, improve healthcare. Uh, and there's a lot of issues with that from ethical perspectives, but that's brought me then to look at the same concept um, in other areas as well. Um, so this is a quote from Jim Evans, a geneticist in North Carolina I worked with, um, but one of the promises of individualized, individualized medicine is the possibility of engaging in the level of preventive care, right? And I think this is really one of the aspects that we want to merge into these types of systems. But one of the things that's frustrated me so much about these conversations, and I think goes to uh, the types of, of systems that we're looking at here, um, is that a lot of people talk about, oh, it's great, we'll give people their genetic information, tell them that they have a BRCA result, and then ta-da, um, they'll all of a sudden access prevention, right? Um, but information prevents <laughs> disease only if it improves the uptake of those interventions, right? So how can we think about um, what works? And also, as we're learning more and more about different variants, right, we have um, different variants where we're not sure if that if the typical stereotypical preventions that stem from genetic conditions should be taken for every single person who doesn't have a family history who doesn't um, have stereotypical risk factors so i think there's a lot of gaps between the information that's presented right and what we actually do with it so there's a lot of space for us to do research in these areas um, but in general uh, I want to step back and talk a bit about how this is being implemented in other parts of society and then turn back to learning health systems, right? So there's a rising uptake of programs that are encouraging individuals to learn their genetic risks and other health prevention, right? So this could, I, I specifically look about genetic risk, but there's all sorts of things like collecting data through Fitbits and, um, and other health data, right? And so uh, three of the ones that come to mind are employer wellness programs, insurance benefits for their consumers or their policyholders, and to direct to consumer testing, of course, right? Um, but I'm gonna focus in on, on the employer side and the insurance side uh, and look a little bit into what those programs look like and then say, well, what is this? What do we do in health systems with this information? So employer wellness programs, um, there's a couple of different forms and they're becoming well, there have always been quite controversial, right? So we have a couple different types of employer wellness programs out there um, that are either participatory or health contingent. So what this means is um, a participatory employer wellness program is, hey, if you uh, participate in this program, you'll get a lower um, gym membership, right? If you go to the gym four times, you get a lower gym membership. A health contingent one is you have to lower your BMI by so much or you have to lower your cholesterol by so much and then you get the benefit. Um, and these can be lower premiums on health insurance and they can actually be quite expensive. There's a whole controversy over that, right? And so right now there are some employers that are offering genetic screening as participatory wellness, right? All you have to do is participate in this program and we'll give you these genetic results. And they're giving them pharmacogenetic results and um, some of the ACMG 59, right? So genetic markers where you can do something about it, you can prevent them, right? Um, and the idea of this is there's a potential for public health benefit, right? We give people information and ta-da, they're healthier, right? Um, but there's a lot of critiques of this, right? So um, there's lack of data on those health benefits. Um, the real concern is that employer wellness programs are essentially being used to shift healthcare costs to the individuals, right? So, um, and that the data can be used in nefarious ways. And I'll come back to these critiques in a second, right? Another thing I'm starting to look at more and more are insurer wellness programs, right? So there's uh, increasing, uh, Increasing programs where insurers are offering policyholders incentives and premium discounts to participate in programs. So some examples, John Hancock has a vitality program where if you use Fitbits and get information, then you might be able to uh, get 
uh, incentives or lower premiums. Um, and then there's actually in the genomic space, there's a company that's selling genomic screening to life insurance companies that they're then giving to their policyholders, right? So it's not for underwriting purposes, it's a benefit of their pro of their of being a policyholder. But they then, of course, um, so the idea for the life insurers and for these programs is it's a win-win. You give the people information, they lower their risk, that means they're not submitting as many claims, everybody saves money, and policyholders are um, healthier. Again, information, health, ta-da, right? Um, but similar program critiques. How is this information actually being used? The insurers aren't just giving this information because, I mean, they're giving it for health, right? But what are they doing with all of that data? Um, and so where this ties into learning health in a couple of different ways, I'll start to merge back into that, right? Because we've talked a lot about that feedback loop in a learning health system. And um, that's not necessarily guaranteed in these types of outside programs. But I actually think there is a feedback loop, right? So we're getting that data, we're giving it to patients, and then it's not necessarily translating back to health because it's not put into a healthcare arena. Um, so that knowledge to practice piece is missing. But what's actually happening is that these types of wellness programs are learning systems couched as health benefits, right? But where the learning is actually happening is they're likely learning business systems, right? They're actually, the problem is that the data is being brought in by these uh, companies that are then turning around and using it for their benefit, right? So they're using it to shift healthcare costs to employers. They're using it to maybe collect data for information to underwrite better for insurance companies, right? So we have, this ostensible health system um, or health benefit, right, in a learning business system. Um, so feedback loop is being used for goals beyond health. Um, and then a lot of the critiques are that there's a potential for coercion um, and potential for uncertain results, right? So I'm gonna, that's sort of the background of a lot of the research I'm doing on what those programs mean, but now I wanna turn back and talk a little bit about how that then relates to learning health systems, both the fact that all these people get information from these programs and then come to a health system and say, what do I do about this? And also um, what learning health systems can do instead, right? Um, so this is, uh, you know, my main, um, one of the things that I keep on coming back to with these types of problems is that knowledge about the risk without clear next steps it's like giving a you know, kid a candy shop and putting a window in front of it, right? So we're giving these employers and these policyholders this information and saying, ta-da, go out and fix your health, and then what, do, what can they actually do, right? So the next step is they're going to take that information and walk over to their doctor and say, hey, I just found this from my employer wellness program. They just told me that I'm at risk for this disease. They just told me that I have this genetic marker that means that I have um, uh, I metabolize this drug a different way, what now, right? Um, so this is gonna challenge healthcare systems um, for a number of different reasons, right? Um, one, it's gonna strain limited resources, of course, because you wanna uh, help patients in a certain way and that information is being pulled in and so what does that do to um, the doctor-patient relationship if, if it's not really the best clinical information, right? Um, and one of the big things for how we think about learning systems is the data is going to arrive in various forms, not always useful for further, further research. And this is a problem um, of genomic data within a health system, is how do you store it in a way that's going to be helpful? So if we also have this data coming from outside, how do we store it in a way that, that will be useful to turn this back around? Um, and one of the big concerns from the LC perspective outside is this potential pressure for overtreatment. And I don't mean necessarily from the doctors, but from the patients to come in and say, no, but I really need this, and how do I 
how do I do this, right? Um, and so there's going to need to be clinical decision support that helps this as the information comes in and they say, okay, you got a positive whatever test, here's how you, how, what the clinical decision will be if you have no family history, if you have a family history, if it's this variant, if it's a VUS, right? How do we go through all of that? Um, but where this comes into some of the discussions that we've been talking about today um, is I was struck by Kate's uh, synopsis of some of the other talks about not building bias into the system. So another problem is that if the information of people who are getting screened um, is coming from these outside sources of people who are able to afford insurance, who are able to work, um, who are working for companies that offer these, right? We have all this data that's coming from a certain source um, rather than doing this at large. Um, and so we could have inequitable problems there. Uh, and so looking at that, I think I have a lot of critiques of uh, these other sources doing genomic data and think that it would be much better, right, in a learning health system. Um, and so if we do this type of screening in a learning health system, right, it creates this feedback loop that's linked to prevention and health goals. Um, we can create uh, systems of electronic health records that really merge this in. Um, and we can take on the uncertainty of the results as this research opportunity to loop back together. Um, but then how do we learn about some of the critiques of other programs in a learning health system, right? Um, so are there risks from the other settings that we can bring back to help us think about learning health systems? And I think there are, and we've actually talked about a lot of them already, right? So one of the risks is that it becomes about money and not necessarily patient care, that we have that learning business um, system rather, or rather than the learning health system, right? So Ramesh gave a couple of really good examples of this where it, there was a great example of saying, well, we can save money if we get people to not, um, to not uh, cancel their appointments, right? So that can save, and that's an important piece because it's tied to access and to equity, right? And then he also talked about the example of, yeah, and then here's the time where we could save money by not offering services to people in a certain area, right? And so, and that's essentially what's happening potentially within the employer and insurance settings is they're using that feedback loop for those, those problematic business decisions. And so we have to make sure that those don't al also get within the learning healthcare system, right? And so he gave a good example of, yes, here's where we can save money and that's good for health, but let's not always just jump to that when it's bad for equity and bad for health, right? Um, and then I think it's also important, and we've talked a lot about this as well, is the whole idea of coercion and pressure, right? And so one of the big concerns about employer wellness programs and insurance is that people will feel like they have to participate in these programs, that they're being coerced and pressured to do this, right? And so in a way that also parallels our discussion of informed consent and knowing about whether or not you're part of these uh, programs and being able to opt out of research, right? And so um, I'm not saying that screening and learning healthcare systems is coercive, but I think it's helpful for us to think from that valence um, of how people's perceptions of these programs in other settings can also come into a healthcare system, right? So Michelle gave examples of the concerns of equipoise and offering different choices. So I think it's helpful to think about that, the, the types of pressure that can be put on patients in two ways, right? One is joining the research at all, right? So we talked about that with uh, Michelle's Pearson example and, and merged into the learning health system. And also then what do we do with making a choice given the results, right? So I think a lot of our, our research in learning health systems will find that this may be a little bit better, marginally better, but this one is also an okay choice for patients and sometimes they have a reason to choose one or the other. So how do we build those options um, into the systems as well? Um, so not a groundbreaking conclusion here, but I think that it's better to have this type of research for genomic prevention happen inside of a system um, and not happen outside, but employers, direct to consumer, and insurers are running down this pipeline, and so learning health systems have to both be ready for that data coming in and also take the opportunity to do that in a better way. So thanks so much. <laughs>
I know. Someone, someone turned. Someone must have turned the clicker on. <laughs> it wasn't me. Um, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to this wonderful symposium. It's a true. It's truly a privilege, a privilege and an honor to be here. For this talk, I would like to share my perspective on the roles of race and representation, i.e. diversity and inclusion, in learning health systems. Much of what I will discuss are challenges and questions raised within the context of genomic research, but are also relevant to learning health systems. But first, I do not have any conflicts of interest, and the opinions I share are my own. A focal point for me today is the question, Given the enormous opportunities presented by technology, how do we better promote and understand human diversity in learning health systems in ways that can help reduce health disparities? And how can learning health systems appropriately address racial and ethnic inequities without also misusing and inappropriately applying race-based categories? The research community has sounded the alarm with regard to the lack of diversity in genomics research. But there is a mismatch between the way many people categorize themselves and the racial labels applied in research and medical contexts. Also, as we stated here in an article I published with geneticists at, the, at NIH, at the Center for Research on Genomics and Global Health, if we do not study diverse people, and I will insert here using um, electronic health records, artificial intelligence, precision medicine tools and technologies, if we do not study diverse populations and also study diversity within racial and ethnic groups, then our understanding of human genetic variation will be limited and so will our ability to apply knowledge about genomics to a growing majority of diverse people and populations globally. Many of you are familiar with this slide. This is a slide uh, presented often within the genomics and LCN genomics communities. In 2016, doctors Fullerton and Pope Joy found that little has changed since 2009, when it was discovered that over 96% of genome-wide association studies Studies that study hundreds of thousands of people to investigate the relationships between genomic variations and disease traits. These studies were done on samples mostly from European populations. They went back, looked at the data in 2016, seven years later, and saw that there was a slight change and increase in 20%, mostly of Asian populations. But when it comes to people of African ancestry, Native Americans, Latino, Latina, Latinx populations, the percentage is still under 4%. The authors also note, and this is something that's not talked about as often, that the there's a reliance that they saw in the data on racial and ethnic categories, and in particular that the term black or sub-Saharan Africa was often used. And as I have here, they observed considerable heterogeneity in descriptions. For example, 26 terms, including black cases and sub-Saharan Africa were, or sub-Saharan African, were used to describe people of African ancestry. The most geographically specific and informative descriptions were those used for samples of European origin as previous studies have shown. When we use the terms black and sub-Saharan Africa, we lose a great deal of nuance related to culture, genomics, environment, as well as ancestry. And these factors obviously contribute to health outcomes. How can learning health systems correct this problem? Importantly, members of the public also feel this way. Racial and ethnic demographics in the United States are always changing, and they are changing rapidly now. In 2012, the Census Bureau reported that 51% of babies born in the United States would identify as a minority. Again, Latino, Latina, Latinx, for example, are very good examples of groups that have ancestry that can be traced back to multiple continents. News outlets have reported that a growing number of students and applicants for jobs, as well as people filling out the census, have trouble choosing a box on the forms or don't want to identify with only one ancestral group or racial category. 
Second, racial categories in the United States continue to change over time. This is a really wonderful chart that was put together that you can find at census.gov that looks at ancestry over the years, starting in 1790. We had limited groups in 1790. Our racial categories and colors were free, white or other, and slave. In 1860, we added white, black, mulatto. In 1890, white, black, mulatto, we observed immigration from, or additional immigration, Chinese, Indian, Japanese, and also began to, some could say, start to describe diversity within African American populations. We use the terms that some find offensive now, such as quadroon and octoroon, to describe people and the one drop rule that was used in the United States and, may, and for some people continues to be used. This is a really interesting chart produced by 23andMe. And what it shows is um, ancestry that was mapped across the United States. They looked at about 160,000 of their 23andMe customers and published this in 2014. And we know, many of us don't know our genetic ancestry, exactly where we're from. There are cases where people who might identify as white are surprised when they find out that they have a sickle cell trait because many people also believe that sickle cell is a disease only from African Americans or that you experience or that's a black disease um, when in fact it's a disease that's prevalent to that came about because of malaria in many different Mediterranean countries. And so people learn about their ancestry in that way, right, through genetic testing. So it's an interesting illustration that reflects our socio-political history and also the diversity within populations that might self-identify as white. Similarly, census categories fail to account for the diversity within African American populations. Here we can see African ancestry among African Americans also changes according to the study as you move across the, the state, I mean the country. So race and ethnicity do not capture the range of potential genetic and ancestral contributions to patients and research participants and, importantly, cannot be used to predict genotype. As the biomedical research community transitions to operating within learning health systems, we can expect the medical significance of racial and ethnic categories to decline. How will learning health systems tackle the many meanings of race and ethnicity? This is not to say that race is not a powerful social construct. The census categories are used by OMB in order to keep track of people in a uniform way. One of the uses is to monitor for employment discrimination and housing discrimination. But biomedical researchers use these categories as well when categorizing populations. Racial, uh, so these racial categories help us to keep track of disparate outcomes, but we should remember that people also try to avoid racial categories or try to ignore or don't want to learn about their past ancestry. Or there's a lot of emotional sensitivity around learning about your racial or um, ancestral ancestry because of the socio-political environment and history here in the United States. And so I have these two images, one from a 1986 story published in the New Yorker by author Trillin about the story of Mrs. Susie Phipps, who unsuccessfully sued Louis Louisiana um, because she was marked as black on her birth certificate. And um, she, was, um, she was marked as black because her great, 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 great grandmother was black. And so um, she wanted to be uh, noted as white. So a quote published in 1983 in a Washington Post article captures some of the social sensitivities around race for Mrs. Phipps. Nothing is bad about being black if you're black, but I'm white. I never was black. I was raised white. Twice she married white, she said. My children are white. My grandchildren are white. Mother and daddy were buried white. My social security card says I'm white. My driver's license says I'm white. There are no blacks out where I live except the hired hands. My birth certificate is the only thing that says I'm black. Obviously for the public, we must ask how much does genetics matter compared to other ways that we identify ourselves, our lived experiences, and the communities that we belong to. I thought it was interesting that in 2018, their genetics and ancestry has come up in politics as well as um, 
the Washington Post and this Atlantic report about a man who found out that he was 4% black and sued because he wanted to be considered a minority business owner. There was a lot of debate about that. So the reality is that we are all multi-ancestral, and the deeper we dive beyond racial categories, the more we are likely to understand about human diversity. So this is an example I use a lot. Um, my colleague, Dr. Otimi, um, and uh, Dr. Jord published this on ancestry and disease. Um, this illustration that I have has to do with a Bacavir hypersensitivity syndrome. And so this is an example within the context of pharmacogenomics. About four to, four to 8% of patients with HIV infection who are treated with a Bacavir experience this potentially life-threatening syndrome. Originally, it was thought that the incidence of AHS was much lower in non-European populations, and so screening, it was recommended, should take place in European populations only. An examination of the global distribution of this allele, and also a closer look at five U.S. ethnic groups that participated in the International Hat Map study, showed that there is a lot of interpopulational diversity. So this is a really good illustration. It's actually Gujarati Indians living in Houston, Texas, who have the highest variation of this allele. If you look at the African populations that are listed here, the Luya in Kenya and the Maasai in Kenya, both groups that would be categorized as black on the drug label, there, the variation and the risk of uh, Abacavir hypersensitivity syndrome is very different. It's completely zero in Nigerian populations, in the Yoruba, in Ibadan. And so when we look around the globe and we do more research on diverse populations, we can learn a lot about di differences within these groups. So I'm running out of time. I wanted to share this story because this article talks about the medical implications of not studying diverse groups. Um, the authors looked at cardiomyopathy and the utility of genetic testing in African-American populations. And so they found, and I have the language here in blue, um, that the, result, the results showed a significantly higher positive detection rate and a significantly lower rate of in inconclusive results in white individuals in comparison with underrepresented minorities. This suggests greater clinical usefulness of genetic testing for cardiomyopathy in white persons in comparisons with people of other racial and ethnic groups. So what this shows, or what it showed to me, was that we run the risk, even as we develop all of these advanced technologies, of still using this, these technologies on populations of European ancestry. And using race and ethnicity labels on everybody else. And just a few weeks ago, Vox picked, picked this up and published a study with the headlines, genetics has learned a ton mostly about white people, that's a problem. And this means that this conversation is in the public sphere. Trust, trustworthiness, trust of our research institutions, trust about what's happening to our taxpayer dollars is going to be really important, right, as we try to recruit people to these studies. So as we engage and have this discussion in the public sphere, how do we show people that we do care about diversity and inclusion, and we also care about the justice and fairness principles in the Belmont Report? My colleague and I wrote this article, my colleagues and I wrote an article, Will Precision Medicine Move Us Beyond Race? And I think the question as it relates to learning health systems is also relevant. And we talk about the increase in technology, but the persistent, the way the use of race has persisted, as well as the many other factors that could uh, prohibit or become barriers to the use of factors besides race or the use of precision medicine um, in all groups, regardless of uh, socioeconomic status, race or ethnicity, and that includes, or gender, greater diversity and inclusion in research, affordable access to precision medicine interventions, and appropriate resources and training for healthcare systems and providers. So are these similar questions that, or um, solutions for learning health systems, or do we have additional questions? What do we need to ask, and how do we achieve justice and fairness in a learning health system, knowing the mistakes we've made within the context of genomic research? And finally, this was a slide uh, that I published also with my colleagues from CRGGH, and we talk about key barriers to um, diversity and inclusion. Everyone is talking about diversity and inclusion right now. 
why has the progress been so slow and uneven? We've been talking about it for a long time. And so some of the highlights are lagging diversity at all levels in research, from the participants to the peer reviewers, to the leaders, to the principal investigators, to the funders. Um, and we give examples of, uh, one really great example is human heredity in health in Africa, where money is going to researchers in Africa so that they can conduct studies that are prioritized locally and, um, they have there also there's an embargo on the data they collect so that they can be the first to publish on that data for 23 months. So what can we incorporate here um, to wrap up? How do we better engage communities? How do we get over the preferred core cohort problem where we know sample sizes are, are larger in European populations? So we go back to those sample sizes. We can we compare all other research, including in African ancestry populations, to the preferred cohort. And we create technology and arrays that can only pick up gene variants, mostly in European populations, and miss um, alleles in um, African populations. So how do we improve um, our analytical ability and overcome these limitations to make research just and fair for all? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to all of our speakers. Uh, that was really important material, and I really appreciate um, you keeping to time, and apologies for missing your sign. Um, I know it gave us all a lot to think about, so there are microphones available in the audience. Somebody will come around if you want to raise your hand, and we will bring one to you. But I want to first turn to our discussant, Dr. Marsh, uh, for the first question or comment in response to our panel. Thank you, Julie. Um, I just want to confirm with Kate, I have 30 minutes for questions myself, and then the audience has... Oh, oh, okay. All right. I just, I just wanted to make sure we were, we were straight on that. Okay. All right. Um, first of all, thank you to this distinguished panel. Um, it, it was uh, quite a journey. Um, I do, uh, I do research in women's health, and um, one of my personal goals in the work that I do is to make sure that all women are represented in the medical literature, regardless of where they live, what language they speak, who they love, how they love, what country they were born in, the color of their skin, um, whether they're in an ur urban environment or a rural environment. And so I, I, there is a tremendous um, opportunity for learning health sciences to, to um, ensure that that happens. Um, uh, and in your discussions and in some of the discussions this morning, um, there's, to, to ensure that, um, particularly in the genetic and, and precision or personalized medicine space, um, is more representative. There's, there's been a suggestion that um, we, we need to move that from private or corporate space to uh, the academy, to academic medicine, to spaces where there's, you know, where learning health systems exist. And I just want to challenge you and push back a little bit on that. And um, with my first question, I will let I, I will let the audience ask questions as well. So I'll start with one question is, um, you know, why do we think the academy is a better place, any better than private or corporate um, spaces? Uh, um, we can certainly, I think there are pros and cons. Um, the academy and academic medicine has its own set of challenges with regard to diversity and um, appropriate representation. Um, so I, I guess there's a couple of questions. One, is the academy the appropriate place? It, is learning health systems everywhere that it needs to be? And how, what do we really need to do to, to make sure that um, there is true diversity and representation beyond um, beyond corporate America, beyond academic medicine. Um, I guess we'll start with that. Uh, so I, I can um, start with that. So 
Yeah, I think that that's a good way of putting together sort of Shaniqua's and my, my talks. I think the biggest piece why I say that I think it's better to do this in a learning health system rather than an employer insurance or corporate space is the feedback loop, right? So I am skeptical of the idea that um, those programs are really about health and not about money. And so, so that's not to say that diversity and inclusion will come from anything, but I, I'm not sure that the motivation, the underlying goals are there. They might be there for some employers, right, or some insurers. They're, it's not that they're all bad actors, right, but if we, we have this as um, the underlying motivation, I think m it is more likely that, that those monetary business reasons will come to light. So then there's more opportunity in the learning health systems uh, and care to um, really be about health. And then the question is, how do we make it about the health of everybody in an inclusive way? Um, and so that's the challenge, right? And that's one of the reasons I wanted to make those comparisons is there's no guarantee that they'll be set up in the same, you know, that they won't be set up in, with the same motivations or with the same problems of, um, employer and insurers. Uh, and I think the other thing talking about academic medical centers is we also have the rural urban divide, right? So how do we how do we include via telemedicine or those zip codes that not everybody is accessing health, right? That wasn't actually all rural, rural urban, but um, there's a lot of different types of diversity that we have to reach out to in a lot of different ways. Um, but I think there's more of a space when we put that goal explicitly um, in that space. Sure, I can add to that, and I just want to say, and there can be, there are plenty of people even in urban environments who don't have access to mobile phones or any of this technology, so you're right, I meant to mention the, that kind of diversity and inclusion. What's really interesting to me, and I wonder, it would be interesting to do a study to see how people, regular people feel about participating in federally sponsored research at an institution. I'm sure it will vary depending on how they feel about the institution. And participating in a, a, an employer-sponsored program where there are so-called benefits, or just ordering results from a company like 23andMe. And um, what makes a person more interested in going the route of commercial testing or working with a private company and less interested in working with a federal funded um, person? Because everyone has their interests and their agenda. And um, one book that comes to mind is Alondra Nelson's book, The Secret Life of DNA, where she talks about how African Americans were really interested in ancestry testing and how they used it as a form of reconciliation, as well as un understanding and identification. And through this company, whether the results were accurate or not, um, people were, felt they got something back. And uh, the company was able to provide that in a way that the, um, universities are still working on. So I think it's a great question. So I was uh, curious about the question about being in academic medical centers versus the private sector, because I don't see some of the work that we're doing that's most related to this as happening necessarily within academic medical centers. So for instance, the collaboratory project that I mentioned, the time trial, was among the two largest providers of dialysis in private settings throughout the whole country. So thousands of dialysis centers, wherever that care was delivered, but they had a centralized monitoring system. And it's a, and it's a problem that affects people of all races, genders, ages. Um, and so it's a really important space. But the take home piece of this is who is, who is gonna pay for this research? Even though this research that's necessary to drive learning health is lower than traditional mm -hmm. research, in whose interest is it to pay? And so part of what you're seeing is people who stand to benefit financially by making more efficient decisions, I'm not saying those are better decisions, but more efficient decisions are stand to profit. But we as, as potential patients or clinicians also need these data, right? So drug company A is not, doesn't really wanna know if their drug works better than B unless they're certain going out of the, the box that A is gonna win. Right, but we as people who have these approved drugs really wanna know whether A is better than B as patients, as clinicians, as payers, everybody wants that information. So it's not in the private sector's interest to do that, say, direct comparative work, but we all want that info. And so who's gonna drive that? And I think so federal sources, foundation sources, those are gonna be the sources for the most neutral bodies. And where the worries are is 
could somehow these other bodies that also have an interest in paying less. So you could you could say if an insurer pays less for things that aren't necessary, they can pay more for the things that are and achieve greater health equity. It's another way to think about it. So I think it's more it's not as simplistic as it might at first appear. It's really, really tough to work out. I think in the meantime, the reason why academic medical centers are playing a role in some of this research is because the NIH has stepped up on that to be, the ability to pro provide funding for the infrastructure to do the research that could take place anywhere. Was that confusing, confounding? Did I go over my minutes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's open it up to the audience for some questions. I see a hand over here. Can we get a mic down uh, in this table in the middle? Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for your presentation. So I want to take a little different slant, thinking about the reasons why um, underrepresented minorities would not be participating and trusting um, the research that happens. And I think that in education, we are used to talking to our students in the health professions about underrepresented minorities in a negative light. We emphasize the things that are wrong in the communities. We emphasize the diseases that they're more prone to have, that they're more vulnerable for. And it, there's not many opportunities to teach our students about the assets that being in those communities bring. So the questions that are asked are negative from the beginning. So when they go out to care, even no matter what the system, when a patient walks in, they're immediately thinking a certain way because of what they associate with that patient coming in. So I walk into an emergency room with abdominal pain, no matter what I say, no matter what I've studied, no matter who I say I am, the first thing in mind is, is it an STD versus is it something else? So I think that if we are considering the role of learning health systems from the point of view of education, we also need to diversify the questions we're asking and the way we're describing these populations so that our students, when they become healthcare professionals, see black women, not only for what they are vulnerable for, but also for the network they have, the supportive system they have with their children, things like that. If we don't change that mentality, then anytime we're going to speak to these populations, the reaction is, you're just gonna come and tell me what's wrong with me and why it's worse to be my population, my person, than to be somebody else. Any response, follow-up from this panel? Well, I just want to thank, thank you for those comments because I, I completely agree with you. And we talk about it at the medical school where I teach all the time. How do we talk about race because of those bio biases? When do we write down race in the, in the medical record? So I completely agree that it's very important. Thank you. Uh, another question from the audience. Uh, over here in the back. So I wanted to thank everyone for their comments. I mean, I definitely learned a lot, especially about including, um, expanding diversity, equity, inclusion for people who might not, who have historically not been included enough in capturing data and generating knowledge. Um, in a discu discussion that we had uh, yesterday in a writing session, uh, Brendan Delaney really eloquently said, you know, one way of thinking about an LHS is it really puts equal or very close to equal value on sort of capturing experiences and data and practice, generating knowledge from it, and mobilizing that knowledge back into use. I haven't heard as much in this discussion about, so, so, so you include more people that wouldn't have been included and you, and you get, get knowledge about their genetics and things. How do you make sure that knowledge gets back to them that knowledge, in, in language they can understand, in ways they can understand, in places they can access it? Because if it all gets published behind a paywall in the New England Journal of Medicine, it's not gonna make a difference. Mm -hmm. Great. Erica? Oh, sorry. <laughs> or, yes, we can both respond. I think, you know, there's never enough time to talk about everything. But one of the things, when I was thinking about this talk, I really wanted to spend some time on justice and fairness. 
and how the Belmont Report emphasizes the burden of research being on communities who um, can benefit from uh, the, the intervention and the research and making sure that everyone has a chance to participate in research. But we also need to spend more time talking about how we ensure that there's a great dissemination. And um, the research community says it does not have a duty, right? We don't have a duty to ensure that people have access. That's society's problem. But if we want people to continue to engage in research and to participate and to do so for a, a sustained period of time, which is what learning health systems and precision medicine requires, ongoing engagement for years and years and years and years, we have to show that you're going to benefit from this or your community will or your grandchildren will, that generalizable knowledge will be relevant to you. And um, if we're unable to do that, I think we're, go we're gonna be unsuccessful, in my view. Uh, I was also going to say, I think it requires looking beyond, I mean, it goes to the same point, right, but it requires looking beyond just um, the data getting back, but also thinking more globally about um, societal barriers, right? So I was working with a um, uh, healthcare system that insured their population, and we were talking about genomic screening, and they said, yeah, we're going to test for these, and I said, okay, well, do you provide insurance coverage for these cancer screenings when it's not based on family history or, or past the certain general population age recommendation? And the answer was, I don't know. Um, and maybe they did, but if you don't think about whether or not some of your population can pay for this service, in, and that was within a closed system, right? Um, so I think it requires the research to think not just what data do I want to collect and how do I get that information back, but what data do I want to collect, how do I get that information back, and then how do we make sure it's accessible either monetarily or geographically or whatever the case may be. So some of the complexities we're dealing with here relate to the health disparities and lack of access to healthcare systems in the first place um, or structural barriers to the ability for all sorts of different people besides people who can figure out getting getting into these healthcare systems. I mean, it, it's it, you, it's the strange group that can get in, right? And a learning healthcare system is predicated on people coming to these marvelous places and having their data engaged and, and being meaningfully getting healthcare. It misses the entire population of patients who aren't in healthcare. And that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's a big social injustice that's gotta be mm -hmm. cracked first before you can ever get to that stage. And so here's part of what I was saying in the first slide after all those introductory ones was, the system's not ready to go, and we're not ready to relax things. Now, in some fields of research with, which are inextricably intertwined with social determinants of health, things like um, international HIV prevention trials, for instance, people don't assume, researchers in the field don't assume that people are just going to come forward in whatever situations are driving them to be at higher risk for HIV infection, and there's a whole movement towards GPP, which is good participatory practices, that is a, a, a very elaborate process for doing really robust engagement of people who are at risk for HIV. I mean, we've conducted studies around the globe, totally other hat that I wear, involving injection drug users in regions where the risk of, of HIV transmission is high, men who have sex with men um, in the Americas, uh, women of childbearing age um, throughout Africa, and, and other parts of Asia and in the US increasingly in, in our cities, you cannot do that research and you cannot meet their needs for HIV prevention, known or unknown at the time, but clearly known as a medical thing without really engaging. This goes completely counter to this movement to pragmatic clinical trials to learning health systems because it requires deep community engagement from the outset, helping in research design, discussion about how you design the research to be most beneficial and possible to do with people who work different lives and, and don't want to come to places like this, like Johns Hopkins, like any of, the, any of the places we come from, and then notifying them about results and engaging them in the next process. But again, that's, it, it's a problem that is so intractable that, and we can identify it in the, in the guise of, say, HIV prevention, but it's a broader problem for health more, more, more importantly. But we need to learn how to do those things well, and I see that as one of the bigger barriers to handling the problems that matter to more people. It's a denominator issue. Um, I, 
you know, as someone who's, whose research um, is very community engaged and, and community dependent, quite frankly, I, I think that in some ways it's complex and in some ways it's actually very simple. Um, um, and it's, you know, what my 95-year-old grandmother refers to as good home training. You know, <laughs> do you respect your brothers and sisters? Do you respect your fellow man? Do you feel, and women, do you feel that um, everyone's voice is important and contributory to advancing health and advancing medicine? Because if we start in that place, then it then it doesn't take a leap to realize that we need to make sure that what we do is relevant to, not to academia, not to corporate America, not to learning health systems, but to the people that we serve, the public. Um, uh, if we go to them and ask what questions are important to them that they want to see answered, then de facto the work that we do is going to be relevant to them. If we, if we take our questions and say, this is what's important to me and this is why I think it's important to you, can you, can you, can you tell me if you feel the same, if you don't feel the same and why, then we're gonna get that information early. Um, if we, if, essentially if we do this work in partnership versus, um, uh, um, uh, apart, then we will have, we, we will, a, a lot of the, the, the um, barriers that come al along the way will not be there because our community partners will, will make it very clear we're not going to go there to do that thing you want us to do. But if you come here and ask us to, to, to give you a blood sample, um, or if you get that person who we trust and know to ask us for a blood sample, we're going to hear it differently. So um, I, I do think it's a complicated issue, but I also, it doesn't need to be, and it doesn't need to be scary. Um, I think we just need to kind of dig deep and realize we have to treat it, you know, if our approach is one of justice, of respect, of inclusion um, from the beginning, not when we've planned everything, designed everything, and are ready to implement, but from the beginning where we're coming up with the questions, where we're designing the, 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 um, the implementation plan, then um, we're gonna find that uh, it's a lot easier um, um, to, to get the work done, that it's gonna be a lot more broadly accepted, um, and it's certainly gonna be relevant to the people that we're doing the work for, so. It's very well said. Um, okay, so I, I saw this hand and then this hand. Oh, and David has already got a microphone in that hand, so why don't you take one, David? Sure, this just really follows up on what you guys were just talking about, but I wonder if you had, could reflect a little bit um, about the differences between the challenges for uh, uh, really having a more just learning health system versus having a more inclusive precision health research program. Because mm -hmm. it seems like some of the things that were being discussed earlier are real, and I, I'm actually op quite optimistic that we're making real progress in precision health research in having more inclusive and having better data representing those groups. But to have a true learning health system that meets the needs of all these populations requires a dramatic increase in uh, in the nature of the kinds of under-resourced uh, health institutions that people are getting their care, if they're getting their care at all. Uh, so I, I wonder if you could talk about the differences between those two and how you think, think of the relationship between them. Um, I, I won't answer your question, but I'll add to the complexity, um, if that helps the, <laughs> um, I mean, I think it is important to think about both and then I think the bigger problem is the, is the reliance on saying, well, that's not my problem, that's society's problem, right? So the problem isn't that the learning health system is inequitable, the problem is that we have a fragmented healthcare system that doesn't properly um, cover all of our individuals, we don't have access, you know, all of the social determinants of health inequality, and so I think it's how do we um, engage, researchers and people within a learning health system to start to tackle some of those issues without saying you have to 
tackle all of those issues because that's an impossible task right now, right? So whether that's engaging more in policy dialogue um, and explaining more about why these things are helpful from the get-go, um, I think I think that that's where the tension comes in, right? So researchers can control who they bring to research. They can't control in the same way who they bring to healthcare because of our system. And, and so I think that's where some of the differences lie. Your question reminded me of the words of law professor and bioethicist pro, pro, um, Professor Patricia King at Georgetown, where she wrote that research and medicine are inextricably linked and that the experiences of minorities, and in particular she was talking about African Americans, is linked with their experiences in the healthcare system. And so if we have a learning health system that fails, um, fails them and they feel injustice and they feel as if they're ignored um, or treated poorly, then that's going to affect how they feel about research and vice versa. So I see, I understand the systems are different. I always think of precision medicine as a tool that can be used within learning health systems. But I think when marginalized populations look at the medical establishment, how they're treated in each sector will be related. Thank you. So I think we have time for two more quick questions. And we've got one over here and then one over here. Um, so on the theme of engaging diverse communities, I part of my job is helping to explain what a learning health system is. And it's not easy to do. So I just wondered if you, in your experience and in your parts of the country, know about community-based organizations or other like community-grounded um, entities that are aware of what a learning health system even is and have suggestions for how to start the, this conversation outside of the academic medicine walls. So, so I also, I'm going to follow the lawyer lead and not answer the question, but, <laughs> but direct it elsewhere. But um, I, I want to just underscore the guidelines I talked about before, the GPP, the Good Participatory Practice Guidelines. If you haven't seen them, they're a, a joint um, set of guidelines that came out of AVAC, the AIDS Vaccine Advocacy Coalition, and um, UNAIDS. And the nice thing about them is they were first derived for that con context, but then now applied to TB uh, programming more globally, and people are starting to adopt them and they're getting traction. The answer is there may be multiple ways of describing whatever the state is of the mythical learning health system you're talking about, right? So what are you learning about and how, where are you? It's, it's a dynamic process. There's not a single answer. There's no single word or single paragraph that's the settled definition for how to describe it. So engaging communities and coming up with a, with a definition that is both uh, correct and understandable to everyone working in that would be a, an important step. And if you tried to follow GPP, that might be an interesting exercise to do. Hmm. And that would be just, it would be a great contribution. Great, thank you. Okay, our last question. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much to all the panelists. It was a really great discussion. Um, Shaniqua, I was really struck by the point you made about, um, well, you were asking what, how, what differences uh, is genetics going to make um, if the way that we understand how it impacts our the meanings of race are completely overshadowed by the other ways we understand what race is. And so, you know, you talked about public dialogue and the ways that there are these kind of competing discourses out there about how we make meaning of these things. And I just was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to how you might envision uh, a productive relationship, say, between public discourse about issues around race and what people are finding in genetics research and, and how those two might come together. Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, my immediate thought um, within two seconds is uh, public education. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with self-identifying with a racial group and celebrating your culture or your identity. Where I grew up, though, in Queens, we didn't say black. We said African-American, Jamaican, Haitian. You know, we identified more than just skin color. Um, but when you move to other parts of this country, for some reason, it's different. But um, 
I think it's okay. Uh, it's obviously all right to talk about the pains and the joys of of social identity and history and politics. But what about also having a, a conversation about that and science and ancestry and the limits of ancestry testing and the limits of genetics, genetic testing? Because genetics is really only a part of it anyway. What about proteins and your zip code and your language? And it's not as if we have all the answers, just as we were saying. The community members, the people we can go out and talk to, have something to say too. And so from the bottom up research, but also conversations about this and believing that people have something to bring to the table and an opinion on this and, and talking about it and having a, a bi-directional dialogue. Those are my immediate thoughts. Yeah. Great. Thank you, everyone. I think you've given us a lot to think about, particularly around engagement and building reciprocity, trust, and justice into this learning healthcare systems right from the, or learning health systems right from the beginning. Um, so I want to sort of give you a round of applause one more time. And then we are going to break for lunch, but Kate has an announcement about lunch, so I'll hand it to you. I know you guys will like me because I have the lunch announcement. All right, so lunch is set up just like breakfast. It's out on those tables out there. And then we have the tables set up in that side room. All of our speakers are going to be spread out amongst the tables. So speakers, you cannot get away because your name will awkwardly be on a table. And so on the other hand, if you would like to speak more with one of our speakers, please feel free to sit at their table and engage in discussion. And uh, we will meet back here in an hour. Thanks, all. So lunch rooms are outside of here or different ones? Yep, so the lunch, so the food is